Our next award is uh, in a, a, a like-minded kind of award in the sense that we've just heard about a, a paper that's transformed science and actually has changed how we think about the oceans. We're now going to step forward in time or earlier in a career and talk about a paper that has been spotted as being something that was just incredibly insightful. And the thing about the uh, uh, about the Jens Schindler Award, or excuse me, the, the Raymond Lindemann Award, is it's for early career scientists. It's it's for an author who's no older than 35 years old for a paper that was just published the previous year, but which was marked as having effect on science. And this year's winner is uh, Daniel Madigan for his paper uh, uh, in uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, about how to use uh, a human tragedy, the Fukushima. Uh, tsunami and radioactivity release and how to understand something about basic ecology of bluefin tuna as a result. The thing that I think is really neat about the paper, and this is, this is the mark I think of a lot of really good scientists, is they take something that everybody knows, a radioactive release will put radionucleotides into water, and then they do something with it that when you hear about it, you go, oh right, of course, I should have thought of that, but they're the ones that had the insight. And I think that's what Daniel's paper does. He has this migratory species that's lost over 90% of its stock in the last 10 years, and he takes a tragedy and turns it into fundamental understanding that's going to help the conservation of the species. So I think with that introduction, I'd like to uh, welcome Daniel to come up to the, the stage and receive the award and also give a brief presentation on his research. So the 2014 Raymond Lindemann Award is to Daniel Madigan for his paper in PNAS. Thank you. So do I control this from the mouse then? Control this from the mouse? Yeah. So I don't know, uh, following the pattern of what's been going on, uh, I don't really know how to make this show up on the screen. Oh, there we go, okay. Um, so there's still some of you left, that's nice. Thank you, uh, thank you guys for being here at, at uh, five o'clock on a, on a Monday. Um, I realized that uh, it's my main focus uh, in my research is uh, large uh, marine predators. So when I got here, I used the uh, JSM uh, search to maybe see if I'd find some people I know since it's a big meeting. So I searched shark and found nothing. And then I searched tuna and found nothing. And then I just for fun put in algae and I think I melted down the, uh, the search engine for JASM. So uh, I know where I stand. So hopefully this is a uh, not too esoteric kind of break from uh, what most of the talks seem to focus on here. So I called my talk Nukes, Nigeria, and Nonsense, The Many Faces of Fukushima Fish. And um, I have to admit to a bait and switch here. Um, in my abstract, if you happen to read it, I, I, I really think the media story, um, the, the response to, uh, from the media to our findings is <clears throat> a story worth telling in and of itself. And that's what I thought I was going to do. And then I realized that, you know, I'm here to accept an award based on a paper, and, and that paper has actually formed the basis for several other projects and papers. So I decided, sorry, but uh, today's 10 minutes will focus on the science instead, um, though the media response is probably much more interesting. Um, so I'll give you the, the brief outline of what I want to talk about. Uh, basically, I want to give you the, the basics of, of bluefin, uh, Pacific bluefin ecology, so that the, the relevance of these findings can be put in some context. Uh, talk about our 2011 findings, which were then published in 2012. Uh, I want to talk about testing the tool. So once we put it forth as an idea, we actually, actually had to test it and see if it really works, and then really apply it to the species and say something new about the species itself. And then I couldn't help it, so I'm going to give you a little bit of media weirdness at the end of the talk. Um, so Pacific bluefin tuna, that's a, um, the, t on, on the left, that's a, a pretty large uh, individual from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, and uh, the, the uh, kind of very simplified um, schematic to the right is just uh, their, their, uh, their migration patterns and their home range. So as you can see, they have an extremely large home range, and uh, an individual can move throughout that entire home range. So uh, they, um, they use the entire North Pacific Ocean, and they also go down to the South Pacific and are found off Australia and New Zealand. 
uh, they're capable of making these transoceanic migrations, which are a really interesting part of their life history. And again, they can move between the uh, Western and Eastern North Pacific, and also go down to, uh, from the North Pacific down to the South Pacific and, and inhabit waters off New Zealand mostly is where, where the large ones are found. But despite that really large home range, they have a pretty discrete spawning area. And again, you know, it depends on your scale, but for that home range, that's a pretty small spawning area. It's only in the Western North Pacific, and that has implications for uh, for the tool that we've used and, and, uh, and how we've applied it. So I feel like this question uh, hits people or should hit people who study a single species. Why do we care about this, this, this one species? Why does it matter? So if, if economics are your thing and money is, <laughs> money is your incentive, um, it's an extremely valuable food fish. Uh, the record keeps being broken in the Skeegee fish market but recently the, the record was broken again and a single fish sold for $1.76 million. And this is amidst an economy that's obviously not doing too well and still a single fish that weighed about 500 pounds and these get, about, get up to about 1,500 pounds, still sold for $1.76 million. Um, and the, the desire for this fish as a sushi fish has, has led to serious population declines. And what's really interesting is that uh, most the other two uh, recognized species of, of bluefin Atlantic and southern have been thought to be in trouble for a long time, but Pacific bluefin were considered data deficient. In the world of pelagic fish, data deficient equals green list. So these guys were green listed till uh, the stock assessment that came out in December of 2012 by the ISC. And finally, when they had enough information to put a number out, they said that it had declined 96% from its pre-fished levels. So in a matter of a few hours, uh, the species went from green list to red list. And uh, environmental organizations were calling for a complete moratorium on, on Pacific bluefin fishing. So like I said, I want to give you just a brief, um, a brief background of, of their life history. So uh, as I mentioned, that schematic, or showed in that schematic, they're, they're all born in the Western Pacific Ocean. Uh, and they grow, some grow up there and, and some stay. Some never leave uh, the general waters of the Western North Pacific. Others uh, tend to find their way to the east side of, J of Japan and migrate east. Um, and once they get there, uh, they forage for years in the California Current. The California Current's one of the uh, major recognized eastern boundary currents of the world. It's high upwelling, it's um, you know, high nutrient, uh, very nutrient rich. It, it has cycles of, um, of uh, high biomass of sardine and anchovy. So what, what it seems like is that the bluefin hang out there for a few years and they basically grow up. And then at some point, they have to return west to spawn because, again, they're only spawning grounds in the Western Pacific. And then there's that group that goes down to New Zealand, which is actually kind of a black box in Pacific bluefin biology. No one really knows about those fish. They don't know if they return. They don't know if they contribute to spawning stock biomass. So we're mostly, uh, we were mostly uh, interested in, uh, at least in the beginning, about uh, the group in the Eastern Pacific. No one knows what percent comes to the east, and this becomes really important for an overfished species because fishing mortality in the east is pretty high. If 10% come across the ocean, then uh, relatively you're not talking about um, too big of an impact on the population if, if fishing impact is really high in the eastern Pacific. If, if it's 60%, 70%, you're talking about a whole different story. So as they're trying to, um, as, as, as management groups are trying to assess uh, the impacts of fishing on this species, this is a huge gap. And actually that ISC, um, that ISC estimate of 96% overfishing didn't, didn't t take into account the eastern population at all because they just simply didn't have the metrics to know how important that group is to the entire population. So it became clear while I was doing my work, uh, my work was working with stable isotopes on bluefin, and I saw that the fish that came across young to the Eastern Pacific really still looked like Japan, uh, the, the, the waters and the stable isotope signature of Japan. Um, but another retrospective tool that would tell, basically tell us who migrated recently and even how long ago would be really useful. So in come the Fukushima accident of 2011, uh, I assume you a lot of you know the basics of this, but basically there's a massive efflux of radiocesium and lots of other isotopes into the ocean. And the massive, there was basically a massive pulse in the spring of 2011, and there have been ongoing leaks, and there are lots of questions about that and how that's affecting everything. But really the massive, really the massive efflux was in, was in uh, the spring of 2011. And this is a map of the currents off Japan and the projected flow of uh, radioactive uh, uh, isotopes from Fukushima as a result of those currents. 
So my very simple question when I was out there collecting bluefin for my uh, thesis work, which I'd been doing for years, was did bluefin carry it over? And um, kind of like Peter mentioned, uh, a lot of people were joking when the, when the tuna were coming up with the smallest ones we know. What's nice is you know the smallest ones are from Japan. What you don't know is, is, is about the bigger ones. But everyone was saying, oh, maybe this tuna is radioactive and joking around, but no one really wanted to do anything with that. And I thought it was worthwhile to actually test it. So I'm sure people have been in this position before. I, I wasn't really sure what I was going to find, and I, I had my doubts about the whole thing. So I, I collected 15 fish. You need a lot more tissue for this type of analysis than for my other work. I wish I would got 150 or 300 fish in retrospect, but this is what I did. And I called up a collaborator, someone I'd met earlier uh, at Stony Brook University, and asked him if he could test for these radioisotopes, and he said yes. So I sent him all the 15 fish, and all 15 fish carried this radiocesium. So there's a decent amount going on here, and I, 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 can't, I can't stick on it for too long, but basically the point I want to make is uh, the, the, the blue and red pie chart uh, in the Western Pacific represents um, the ratios of two different cesium uh, radioactive isotopes that went into the water off Fukushima. And the, the, uh, the ratio of these two were known. So it was about one to one, which was strangely convenient and, and uh, consistent. But the blue represents cesium-137, a shorter, uh, sorry, a longer-lived isotope. It has a 30-year half-life. And the red represents cesium-137, which has a two-year half-life. So basically what you'd expect is if an animal foraged in that water that had the one-to-one -one ratio, you'd expect about the same once they came over to the Eastern Pacific. And that's exactly what we saw uh, in the, in the post-Fukushima um, bluefin. They had about a one-to-one -one ratio. Some of the 134, cesium-134, um, which you see in the pie chart, the red and blue pie chart uh, in the Eastern Pacific to the right, um, had uh, already broken down, uh, but the cesium, given a 30-year half-life, the cesium-137 uh, hadn't much. And our two controls were bluefin preceding the Fukushima accident and yellowfin in the Eastern Pacific uh, after the Fukushima accident. So we were, trying to, we were trying to control for two things. We wanted to know if there was a source before the Fukushima accident that bluefin could have picked up before this, this ever happened. So we measured bluefin, same size, uh, same migratory history from 2008. And as you can see, that, that, that small blue circle basically shows that they had no cesium-134 and only cesium-137 in background levels, and the yellowfin looked exactly the same. So we were able to rule out previous, um, previous sources and also sources from the uh, transport of the cesium itself. So everyone want, wanted to know about the health aspects of this. Uh, this was in a follow-up paper that we did, and we basically found that it would cause two additional fatal cancer cases per 10 million people. This is based on a lot of assumptions, and uh, what it basically said is that the effects were negligible, and we were really interested in the scientific tracer aspects. And what we found is that we could both back calculate migration timing and also maybe trace other pelagic predators. And I'm sorry, I, I see I'm already getting the hook, so I'm going to speed through this here. Our two follow-ups, we wanted to prove that this tracer worked. We had to see that the, all, um, all recent migrants carried the signal and that the residents, uh, fish that had been there for long enough, would lose it. That means that we can actually use it as not just a signal of migration from a certain region, but recent migration. So if you remember the smallest ones have migrated recently, on the x-axis here you have age or size. And what we found is there's some threshold age. Before that age, they all carried it, which made us believe that the smallest ones, the ones that definitely came from Japan, all picked it up. We were kind of surprised about that because a lot of things had happened for that to work, but that's what we found. And then as you got into older uh, year classes, we found that there were more and more residential in the Eastern Pacific. And then when we combined the transient cesium, radio cesium tracer with uh, an, a tracer that would work ad infinitum, like uh, stable isotopes, we were able to analyze, analyze larger data sets. So we had fish that we only had stable isotope data for, and we were able to basically show that um, through, si the, through the age of the bluefin in the Eastern Pacific, you have basically an age-structured migratory pattern in the bluefin, which was relatively new uh, in terms of the, the movements of the species. And, you know, our major interest in this, as I mentioned before, is that this is an overfished species, and we can hopefully use this to go forward and actually quantify the movements between both sides of the ocean, actually put the Eastern Pacific group into the equations in the first place. We're working with someone who's part of those stock assessments. Uh, we're working with colleagues now in Japan and in Taiwan 
to basically use these tools to look at the, uh, the uh, trans-Pacific migratory dynamics and, uh, and actually put this into a usable fisheries model, which to me, to actually take it and put it into something that's usable for a species that is iconic and people, for the most part, don't want to go away is kind of the, um, the, the most, the most uh, you know, exciting end game for me. So I, I just thought I'd throw you two slides of what we saw. Uh, I kind of went, on went online and cherry picked some of these. I don't know how much you guys have seen some of this stuff. The one on the left, the colorful diagram, went really viral um, just for kicks. Does anyone know what that plot shows? If the scale bar is, is um, not, not too clear, but anyone? Anyone? What's that? So, this, so it's, it's from the site of the tsunami, yeah, and actually the colors represent wave height as, a, as, a, as an effect of that tsunami. So the scale bar here, which a lot of people, people are actually savvy enough to cut out of this diagram just by, just by cropping it from the right a little bit, uh, made it look like this was radiation. This has nothing to do with radiation. This was all wave height following the tsunami. But this worked really well. People were really freaked out about this. This went totally viral all over the internet, and it turned out it had to do with uh, centimeters of, of waves as propagation from that tsunami. And the thing is, people followed up on stuff like this and debunked it, but not everyone who sees this, saw this saw the, saw the debunking part later. So it causes, it causes a lot of fear. And the Fukushima's here was kind of a uh, consistent thing. We saw people writing that on shores and stuff like that, and that happened after the bluefin. Uh, report and then finally, uh, there's a lot of stuff about the fish. People being afraid of eating the fish. Uh, cartoons of these goblins, um, the Fukushima, Fukushima sushi. These are amazingly uh, similar goblins. The uh, the the cartoon on the right is in Danish. So, assuming you know, not all of you speak Danish, it says the fish. Uh, at least the fish aren't too sick to bite. So anyway, uh, I received even death threats on my, uh, on my cell phone as a graduate student uh, as a result of this work. This, and, and like I said, that's where the media really was an interesting experience for me, and I'd be happy to talk to anyone about that um, uh, while I'm here. But um, even at my time is more than up, I just want to thank you guys for being here today on the first day late in the afternoon. I want to thank ASLO for giving me this award, and uh, NSF and SOMAS for, for supporting me through this. Thank you.